Good morning. And welcome to the First United Church of Christ. A special welcome to Jack Greenblatt, who is a good friend of our congregation. He's been here with us many times, and we thank you for braving the heat and uh, being with us this morning. When you see Carl Cook next week, we might to just tell him, I finally remember to bring my blue sheet up all by myself. <laughs> as we look at our prayer concerns as they appear in the bulletin, there's a couple of things to add to that. Uh, I have Patty Schweitzer, who's been worshiping with us uh, the past several weeks, and Patty is going in for some tests. Uh, Shirley Adams, uh, who's having some surgery, a serious surgery on the 5th of July. Uh, the Bourne family, who lost a grandson to, uh, to cancer. And I want to mention to you that, that Doris is, is in uh, St. Louis Anderson again. Next week is Heritage Day, and so I remind you that we will be open us uh, Steve Boyer, who's been with us many times, will be leading worship that Sunday. And uh, the church will be open for tours and so on, so come down to downtown Easton and, and celebrate what's going on in a remarkable, historic, and fascinating city. Any other announcements to share this morning? Then would you please stand for our call to worship? <clears throat> Be joyful in the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Our the Lord is God, who created us, and we are the people of his grace. Come to his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Let him purge our hearts to bless his holy name. Let's sing that marvelous hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore You, number four in your hymn.
So keep our minds ever set on you. Holy Spirit, continue to remind us of what is true and convict us of sin when it is necessary. Turn our hearts back to you. We receive your forgiveness and believe that we are righteous in your sight. Thank you, Father. Amen. Again, we need to remind ourselves that the power that still to see is the same power that defeated sin and death through the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Receive what he freely offers, forgiveness and new life. Hallelujah. Amen. May we sing together the glory of Audrey. because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we die with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, Count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And our gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 10, 24 to 39. The student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household. So do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. 
What is whispered in your ear? Proclaim it from the roof. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword, for I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God.
but the congregation surely said it. Janet, thank you very much. Now, you've shared your talent with us, you've shared your talent with the students in the East Area School District, and uh, it's always nice to know you make a remarkable impact upon the growth and the maturity of the kids in our schools. I think Kathleen would tell you over the next couple of weeks, the, uh, Dow, the TV's the Dow House will be watching a lot of tennis. When will the disc come? Now that all England uh, lawn tennis and croquet club, the club of London hosts, I think, probably the most prestigious uh, of all the tennis tournaments in the world, certainly the, I think, most prestigious of the majors. Now we're tennis fans, so we're going to spend quite a bit of time looking at, at that tennis match. More particularly, we're envious of our daughter Meg and her husband Paul because they're in Wimbledon and have a chance to see a couple of those matches live. And that would be a, a dream for us. Think about the history of Wimbledon. It began in 1877, and ever since that time, it's attracted the, the greatest tennis players in the world to, to play there. Players talk about that being a particularly challenging uh, tournament because it's the only one played on grass. And that's a remarkable, unpredictable surface. The Open Era began in, in 1968, and, and you might know that no one's won more Wimbledon men's championships than Roger Federer. Federer won eight titles. He's followed closely by uh, Novak Djokovic and, and uh, uh, Pete Sampras, both of whom have seven. But the women's uh, singles, uh, Martina Navratilova really, really uh, is the penultimate tennis player. She holds the record with nine uh, singles titles, and she's followed by Steffi Groff and our own Serena Williams with the seven. But I think as we take a, for those who are tennis fans and tennis players, we take a closer look at the game of tennis, it really shows some remarkable parallels to the, the game of life itself. So I'm going to take a little bit of time this morning talking about the similarities between the game of tennis and, and the game of life and see if there are some things we can take away from that as we, we leave the church this morning. Every tennis match begins with a serve, and generally, <clears throat> most players consider the better the serve, the, the better the game. And tennis really is, is in essence, a Game of service, I say the game service is essential. And I think we can say the same thing about the life of a Christian. Service is, is really essential to who we are as Christians. Uh, we don't serve, we're really not following Christ. Following Christ is all about being of service to people. You know, as in the game of life, it's not whether whether the service is going to happen, it's really a matter of to whom we're going to serve, who we're going to serve, and how well we're going to be able to do it. I grew up with Bob Dylan. He got white in his song, Gotta Serve Someone. He wrote this, well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve someone. I think that's exactly what, what Jesus had in mind when he, when he shared these ideas with us. No one can serve two masters, he said. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be loyal to one and you will have contempt for the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Christ pointed out many, many times that, that the Christian life is, is a life of service. So he set the record straight on, on many, many occasions. If we read just a little bit further on in Mark, he says this. Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. A little bit further on in the 10th chapter we read, Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Beautiful words we, we, we hear from Matthew really kind of exactly capture this for us. He said, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and, and, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Truly I tell you, just as you did to one of these, the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. We peruse scripture, we find the same thing coming back into us again and again in Proverbs. Do not withhold good from so do not withhold good for those from those who do. Pardon me. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due, when it is in your power to do. In Galatians, we read this: Serve each other through love. Most important law. All the law has been fulfilled in this single statement: Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law has been fulfilled in this single statement, love your neighbor as yourself. In Galatians, Paul writes again, so then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all. 
First Peter we read, serve each other according to the gift each person has received as good managers of God's diverse gifts. Whoever serves should do, them, should do this for the strength that God furnished us. Do this in that everything God may be honored through Jesus Christ. So service is part of our life as Christians. And I guess the question would be, will we perfectly serve the Lord, our friends, our neighbors, the widows, the poor, the mentally and physically challenged? And I think if we examine our lives, we realize, yeah, of course not. We're not going to be able to do that. But use a tennis term, we might have a footfall. Maybe our service goes to the wrong box. So we're not going to be perfect in the way we serve. But again, to take a tennis serve is always the, the second serve. Maybe you'll get it right the second time. Remember what David wrote in, in the fourth, fourth verse of, of this psalm. But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revealed. If we double fall, we move on to the next serving opportunity and put that behind us and, and begin again. The game is never over until the, the final point. Then this is a contest. And in the match, our biggest challenge is usually the player person across the net from us. But in some respects, in some respects, our opponent is really the least of our concerns. All the opposing player has to do is return the serve. They want to win, but they're playing by, by the same rules. Uh, like you, they face an opponent as well. I would say more often, we're often our own worst opponent. You know, the, the real obstacles on the tennis court are, are factors like, like a boisterous crowd. I remember watching a, a doubles match at, at the U.S. Open, Kathleen, where they were big in there. One of the players, uh, the crowd really got one of the players. They, they didn't like him at all. He had done some things they didn't like. And they got really, really got on. And he lost his temper. He hit a ball out of the court. The referee gave a point. He had a second ball out of the court. Gave two points. They lost that, that particular game. They then went on to lose in straight sets. He disappeared from the court because the boisterous crowd really got on and the same thing can, can happen to us. Sometimes it just gets too hot to, to participate. And then there's dehydration and the, the lines of the court, and, and Wimbledon is a slippery grass surface. I think the same parallels exist in life. Uh, sometimes we're just aggravated by, by people. And the irritation that gets all the worse if we consider them to be our enemy, our, our real rival. Sometimes we're better off trying to, to build a relationship with them. Some folks are just so darn honoring that, that we don't want to have anything to do with them. I heard the phrase the other day, uh, he might be as crooked as a dog's hind leg. I think that's a, a phrase that sticks in my mind. It's not fun to deal with those kind of folks. But somehow we need to find a way to rise above those kinds of obstacles in our life, push through with this life of service. We read what David had to say. He was really in a fix. He writes this, have the depths I cry to you. It's also it shows up in, in Psalm 61. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord, O Lord, pleadingly, hear my voice. That psalm is sometimes called uh, de profundus because it comes from, from the depths of a person's soul. You might be familiar with, with the writings of Oscar Wilde, and Oscar Wilde also wrote a poem called De Profundus. He was a brilliant linguist and playwright, and he wrote that from, from prison. To be in the pits, we've been there. To be in the bottom of the dungeon, in the depths of the abyss, is a dark and dismal experience. David felt it. Oscar Wilde felt it. We've all felt it. And when we feel like we hit the bottom, just like David, we, we feel that everything is lost, and there's there's no hope. We'll get back to that later. So a serious uh, issue a tennis player faces is, is the unforced error. Unforced errors absolutely kill you on the tennis court. We find out usually the pillar of the least unforced errors is the player who wins. And the commentators talk about it all the time during the matches. When I was just beginning to, to look at tennis, I really didn't understand what an unforced error was. And so I, I looked up at dictionary.com and it says this. A mistake, in a, a mistake in play that's attributed to one's own failure rather than the skill or effort of one's opponent. A careless and foolish mistake. Go to tennis.com, uh, the late, late Leo Levin uh, coined that term 40 years ago. 
Let them define it as a situation where you are completely in control and you make the mistake. It's the, the inexplicable screw up. It can't be attributed to your opponent, simply to your, to your own error. It's your kill shot that goes to the net. It's your, your volley that goes over, over the end line. It's just a terrible, embarrassing lapse of skill and judgment. And no one in the state understands why you did it, and nor do you. We watch tennis, you might find a whole bunch of destroyed rackets on the tennis court. They usually occur after an unforced error. Richard and I can talk about golf. We can't break tennis, tennis rackets. It's a bit more expensive, perhaps, to break, break a five iron. But it happens there as well. So I guess what's the peril? Have you ever had an unforced error moment? Ever had an unforced error week? <laughs> the psalmist did. He said, Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord, O oh Lord, hear my voice. Let your ear be attentive to my supplication. He's in trouble. Just like we are when we have the unforced error, we do something so inexplicably stupid that it causes us trouble. It goes against everything we believe. Maybe we betray a confidence. Perhaps we betray a covenant. Perhaps we say things that are unkind and hurtful, and our family members don't understand how it possibly would be so hurtful. And so it's like they've been, they've been caught spitting in the wind, and our family's waiting. If you had it rain, I think we'd die of loneliness. Your paychecks are spent on betting apps and on alcohol and on drugs. Maybe you're having a bad day, and you, people walk around you on tippy toes because they simply don't want to, uh, to cause any more trouble. So we're all jammed up, and, 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 and because of our careless, thoughtless, and foolish choices and decisions, to work, we find ourselves in the depths. We made errors. Nobody forces to make the error. Not the devil, not the boss, not our spouse, not our kids, not the neighbors. The only person in the universe who can create that mistake is, is, is us. Michael Jackson had something to say about that. He said, that's the person in the mirror. And he wrote these words. I'm going to make a change. For once in my life, it's going to feel real good. I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to make it right. I'm starting with the man in the mirror. I'm asking him to change his ways, and no message could have ever been clearer. If they want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and then make the change. David looked in the mirror. He knows the score. He knows the only thing he can do to get his back on track is to seek a fresh start. He said, there's forgiveness with you so that, I, so that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. In his word, I hope. My soul waits. In his word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. It's a remarkable change for a person whose initial comments were de profundus. David, David, we know what David did. David went on to become the person of whom was said in Scripture, who was a man after God's own heart. I think it was when I it was in my, in my first year in, in seminary, and uh, Swiss psychiatrist uh, Dr. Elizabeth Kubler Ross uh, wrote published uh, on death and die. She made an interesting observation about those who have hit rock bottom. She said, the most beautiful people we have known are those who have known defeat, known suffering, known struggle, known loss, and have found their way out of the depths. These persons have an appreciation, a sensitivity, an understanding of life that fills them with compassion, gentleness, and a deep loving concern. Beautiful people, she concludes, do not just happen. Now, in the game of life, we're all going to make unforced errors. We're human. But we do have the opportunity of, of forgiveness. We do have the opportunity for the second serve, the second chance. As Kukler Ross would say, it's beautiful. Jesus Christ on our behalf. Amen.
Christ, the past is past, is gone. It no longer determines who we are or who we can become. Christ took care of all that, so we might look to him for our identity and hope. We are reconciled to God through Christ. We are made new creatures. We receive the promise of God's daily presence and mercy. We are God's children. We affirm our choice to live as those whose inheritance is sure, whose joy is secure, whose present and future are held in the loving hands of our gracious Lord and Savior. And we affirm that, as we sing our next to those workers, Jesus calls us for the tomb, number 172. Christ Jesus, touch us deeply in our worship, touch and embrace our lives, move our lives to generosity and service, strengthen our faith, and direct us into ministries and service for those in great need. We dedicate our lives and bless our gifts, let our hearts help to renew your church and meet the urgent needs of the day. Amen.
Final hymn of worship number six, 617, United Join Your Cheerful Songs.